A very good morning, a very good afternoon, and a very good evening, wherever you are tuning in today from. Hello, my name is Nishit Kotak. I'm here with the team from Hindu Academy. So if you are watching us for the very first time, welcome. And if you are a regular viewer, welcome too. We appreciate every single one of you. So for the new viewers here, let me just quickly explain the format of today's broadcast. We run every Saturday from two o'clock UK time and we run for about 50 to 55 minutes. The format of the broadcast, which is to do with all things Hinduism, uh, the format is we will start with a focus topic. Uh, we will have a little video and then we will do a discussion around that topic. And then later on, we will move on to general question and answer session uh, to answer any of your questions about Hinduism. Now, today's topic is a very interesting one. Some people love it, some people fear it, but it is the topic of the big fat Hindu wedding. So we're going to be talking about Hindu weddings, uh, what they are all about, how they have been uh, evolving over time, what are some of the things that people like about it, what they don't like about it, and how does it play a, a, a part in, in, in Hinduism. And to take this discussion forward, we are going to watch a little video clip, like I said. Let me just bring that up. And we will then uh, go into a, a focus topic Q and A session. So, in okay. You see, most Indian youngsters who go to Hindu youngsters who go to Hindu weddings really complain. It drags on. Sometimes it goes on for days. All sorts of ceremonies taking place over days. Now, there are many different dimensions to religious uh, ceremonials. You see, initially the idea was that two families or society comes together, so it becomes a very social event. So it's a networking opportunity. <coughs> so they have different, you know, uh, days to celebrate different things. For example, this is engagement ceremony, so one cere one particular, uh, you know, ceremony or so on. But the wedding itself is in effect a mix, a mishmash of religious as well as cultural aspect. That is why it drag on, and it's very sad. Because I go to them and I shudder. In fact, I avoid going to Hindu weddings myself. Because it's such a mishmash. There is a priest uh, who is mumbling slokas. Perhaps he doesn't understand half of the slokas himself. He just memorized them. So he's just carrying out a ritual. The bride and groom are sitting in front of the fire, sweating. They don't know what is going on. They say, okay, stand up now. Hold this leaf in your hand. And now pour it this and then go around. And they say, no, no, you go this way around. And all this is going on. While this is going on, the audience is chattering away. You know, they lost, like, lost interest. So they're chatting away about, oh, what's happening in society, what's going on, gossiping. And the children are running around, you know, making noise. And because they want to kind of, you know, start feeding people early, because there are a thousand people there. So people at the back are already eating, you know, with wobbly plates, or plastic plates, and wobbly plates, and they're talking. So there's a lot of, and Bollywood music in the background. So the whole thing is a real mishmash, a really very poor show. But things are becoming a little bit more sober. The actual ceremonial can be condensed into literally half an hour. Half an hour. The key features in the ceremonial is simply this. First of all, they say, just as in any wedding we require a witness, here we say we require a witness who is eternal, so it's going to be forever. And we say fire is the witness. That's why they will light a fire in the, sand, in the middle. So fire is the witness to this wedding. And the idea of going around the fire four times is to simply say there are four aims of Hindu life that we wish to fulfill in our married life, and they are Dharma means kind of making sense of the human condition, Artha, creating wealth, this part of the requirement. Then the next one is Kama, fulfilling legitimate desires is quite okay, it's except, otherwise you, you get in a mess. <coughs> so earn money, honestly, fulfill legitimate desires, and the final is trying to kind of come to, if you like, moksha trying to really see through this reality, see what's actually going on, why I'm born, what is all this? So these are the four aims, that's why they go around the fire four <coughs> times, affirming the four aims of Hindu life. But the most sweeter part of the Hindu ceremonial is called the Saptapadi, where the bride and the groom take seven steps together. This is sweet, because now they're saying, look, we are operating as a, as a unit now, we're not separate anymore. So they say the first step we take is towards spirituality, we want to make spiritual progress in our married life. So the first step is towards that.
Then the other steps are for normal human requirements, you know, you need to create wealth and health and happiness and all this kind of progeny. So these are the steps you take together saying we'll have children, we'll <coughs> have happiness, we'll have health and wealth and strength. And the final step is very interesting in the Saptapadi, you see the sweetness. He says now the seventh step we take together is to show that we are going to be lifelong friends, friendship for life. This is what it is in the wedding. So it's very sweet. But all this gets lost with all this hoo-ha and Bollywood music and dancing girls and everything gets real a mess and it drags on. And there was, you see this again, a one-upmanship in the United Kingdom. See, one person at a wedding which lasted three hours and there are ten sweets. The next one must have twelve sweets. You know, they didn't have ice cream, vanilla. Oh yes, we must put strawberry and vanilla. And they kind of stretch it because they're very, you see, the, human, the Hindu population is very wealthy in the United Kingdom. So they want to show off. This is the only opportunity they have of showing off their wealth. So it becomes a one-upmanship ceremonial. So they really drag it, bring in, you know, dancers and bring in all kind of variety programs and in a way make a mockery of the sanctity of the Hindu wedding. So this is why they drag on. Fantastic. What an interesting video. And you know, the best one I took, the best thing I took away from that video was the line that says friendship forever. And that's the way it should be. And uh, the rest of it can be uh, anything else you want, uh, whether it's a big show off or just a standard small wedding. As long as you've got that, I think you've got your set for life. Well, folks, I hope you are going to enjoy this lovely afternoon's broadcast. And I'm going to hand it over to Manish Pai to carry on with the rest of the broadcast. Manish Pai. How are you and welcome uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Nisid Bhai. A uh, very interesting topic, uh, as Jay Bhai was mentioning, the, all the hoo-ha of Hindu weddings. But uh, Hindu weddings is uh, one very important samskara in a person's life uh, where we are, one is transitioning from the uh, you know, the Brahmachari straight to marriage, uh, uh, Grihasthasana. And uh, it's a wonderful ceremony. But uh, as we see around us, uh, many things happening at the same time and a lot of mismatch of things happen. And the real purpose behind the whole ceremony gets lost in some ways. Uh, what is your take on this, uh, Vijay Bhai? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, view this modern Hindu weddings, and can we do something about it? Uh, all I can say is that uh, in the video we just saw, uh, Jay Bhai is very right because uh, just pick people randomly from, you know, when they are at a wedding, ask them how many know actually what's the spiritual significance. Most of them don't know. If you ask them, name me one kind of mantra that the pujari said. They won't know because as they go there discussing yes, the Jebus business, you know, discussing gossip and all this kind of stuff. So there's no focus. But also I've noticed, because I know some of the verses because I've been doing Hinduism for a while. And sometimes the Pujari also says it in such a mumble kind of voice that you don't even know what he's actually saying. I don't, I don't think he's saying it properly. And sometimes it's a big mishmash. And so, some, you know, it's just... There's so much, uh, as you say, as Jebus, so much showmanship and there's so much, uh, far more cultural in some ways that the Pujari can get away with a lot of stuff which, you know, he should do properly, but isn't because, you know, nobody really cares. So he's not, he's not even put to task sometimes. I'll give you an example. Once I went to a wedding and, you know, Saptapad, the Jebus just mentioned, we like seven steps. And then I saw somebody touching the toe five steps to a beetle nut, seven times. I said, what is this? And he said, Saptapadi. I mean, nobody even noticed that the Saptapadi. Can you imagine touching the toe on the beetle nut seven times? I said, he didn't even mention, you know, the seven steps, you know, the health, wealth, progeny, not nothing like, you know, Saptapadi and then done. I said, what, what is happening? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, nobody else complains because nobody else knows. Well, so I think the thing is, it's a major samskar. I mean, let's face it. As you move from the Brahmachari ashram, the study stage, now you're going to go in, you know, Grahastha Ashram. That's like carrying a burden, a serious burden there, right? You support, you know, other societies, you support the teachers, you know, all the elderly, the society large, your own family. So responses are really immense. So the, the samskara, what, you know, it, it means, sometimes means mental impressions. 
the impression that you could put on your mind or this major step you're taking, that sometimes is lost. And as JV mentioned, sometimes there's so much of this um, showmanship as well, you know, that, oh, I saw last wedding, I have to sh- show that his mind is better. But is it really better if you miss the spiritual part totally? I think people see the visuals sometimes. Oh, I said nice dancers and I don't know, nice number of sweets or whatever. And the actual part of the ceremony, people are missing that. And people don't even know what's happening. Because I, I, sometimes when I go, I try to focus to see. You can't even hear because there's so much noise in the first place. Sometimes the pujari is tricky and he might you know, speak some strong, strong words and people calm down for five minutes. And you may pick some things. But mostly you don't pick anything because it's just, just too much noise. So I think that there needs to be some serious kind of change in how we do this. Uh, what, what I would say is judge a wedding by how, how much spiritual significance came through to you, how much you felt the spirituality <clears throat> of that bond between the two people. If you can feel that, there is a much more bigger kind of measure of how the wedding how it was, not how big the hole was or how many people turned up or whether you had some more sounds or questions. That, that's besides the point. So key focus is, but nobody kind of focuses on that. I, I, I don't know what the, how to go about tackling that, but I think there's a major change in mindset required. I, um, I remember talking to my parents and they had a wedding like uh, for four or five days, but every day was intensely spiritual. The pujas they did, the havas, and there's so much spirituality in it that um, they, they never felt that, that there was more like, you know, a show of a cultural thing. But nowadays, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a strange. I know I went to one wedding, there was, was it engagement, then there's Sanji, then there's, I don't know, ring, I don't know what, what. It's about seven different places, times you go. And you can't even say no, son, because the close ones. Can you imagine seven different activities? It's just, did you miss the actual, okay, so maybe it's fun, I guess. But the actual part, the, the spiritual bond you have, which is the biggest thing in the marriage, that is kind of really good. So I don't know how to fix this because it, I think it's gone a bit crazy sometimes. Uh, Sita, can you continue with this? It's a crazy topic in a sense. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, it is. I think it's gone a bit sort of out of control, really. I mean, people have sort of lost the spiritual meaning behind it. And um, I think it's something that all sort of rituals are at risk of is losing the sight of the true sort of depth of the meaning behind it um, because it all becomes much more about you know all of the stuff around it all the superficial stuff um, and you know you forget the true meaning behind it and it actually does remind me of Christmas actually because it's become so incredibly commercialized it's all about the gifts it's all about you know all the decorations and all of that but there is such a beautiful spiritual message at the heart of it so similarly with the wedding there's a beautiful message at the heart of it and we kind of lose track of it you know as as human beings we like to sort of you know show off and we like to dress up and we like to go out and have a good time and this is an opportunity to have a party but we should also make sure we don't forget um, that actually at the heart of it what it's saying is that two families are joining together they are forming a a sort of a cohesive bond which can hopefully benefit the whole of society so not only can they start their own family but they need to look after their existing family members as well their parents their grandparents their uncles aunts the wider community so we're actually through this ceremony saying I am going to take this responsibility on and it's a big responsibility to make sure that you don't just live for yourself anymore. You're not just a single unit anymore. You see yourself in everyone around you, but especially so your partner, because that's the person you're going to work with for the whole rest of your life to try and do some good um, in the world. So it's a it's a beautiful step and people sort of lose sight of it. And I think what we really need to do is to try and trim down the ceremony because it just gets too much and to be honest like even when I when I was getting married I was saying to my parents I want it as simple as possible but with all the sort of family pressures they're like no you must have so I know you must have this you must have and then you don't want to be kick up a fuss about it so you say okay but if everyone sort of had a similar way of thinking because to be honest everyone does get tired going to five different events it is tiring so if everyone says why don't we just focus on the actual wedding and maybe have a party afterwards if you want then you know you can have a really nice time without feeling tired 
and making sure that you don't lose sight of the, the spiritual message at the heart of it, this idea of therma, because in the householder stage, as Dad was saying, you fulfill so many aims of, of life. And it's a really big step. Your whole life completely changes after you get married. So it's really important to make sure we don't forget that. Okay, that's uh, wonderful. Very well put, uh, Sita Ben uh, Vijay Bhai. Um, as Vijay Bhai said, you know, in olden times, um, uh, in 70s, 80s, when I attended wedding, used to be grand affair, five, five day ceremony, you know, they will start with Mandak Muhurat and then do have, have this um, Mendi Hana ceremonies and uh, <clears throat> uh, also the put uh, turmeric paste um, around bride and groom. So if we start off this on this uh, few few of the initial bits, and then we, we would have the grasanti and some of these uh, spiritual things as well going on. Mandap Muharat, or, uh, you know, plus setting up the wedding uh, place, is it any significant now, Vijay Bhai? How how do we? Is that I mean uh... the the mandap murat actually it's it's actually quite significant because it's to create a pure space first of all a pure spiritual space mm -hmm. and remove all the bad bad you know bad effects you know all the bad thoughts mm -hmm. they're supposed to shout the mandap but nowadays the mandap is actually a very big show. Because it has to be really beautiful. It has to be this special wood. I have no idea. They said if when you when you go to these catalogs of these you know, people who set up the weddings, you see, oh wow, wow. And then when you actually check, you know, when when I mean olden days when people got they had just maybe four poles, right? Maybe some strings and banana leaves, that's it. The idea is the significance behind the ritual is that to create all the negative and environments, create out you know, negative thoughts, create a pure spiritual space. Because a very special event is going to take place there, right? It, it doesn't matter that how beautiful it is. It is a thought of keeping pure mind and spirituality. That's the aim of Mandap Murat. So it was a very serious business at one time to actually we put the Mandap up, the puja is done. But I, I don't see that kind of, you know, that, that kind of thing is lost. But I think in, in that sense, if you understand it and don't do it mechanically, just put them up because it looks nice and then you lose the plot. But if you if you understand the meaning behind it and the spiritual significance behind it, then it's a very big thing, right? That's why when you go in a, even when you go in the wedding, you are supposed to be aware of that. That you know, when you go and in inside the mandap, you take a photograph or you give some gift, you have to think that I'm going in a spiritual space. But that's not the case anymore because I think we have lost that, that understanding, and that's that's the that's the issue. Uh, as I said, I know how to get that back, but I think partly. We need to change some basic, you know, ways of being understanding the wedding, and then I think it'll come back. Once it comes back and you understand it, then it's very beautiful, and you really feel the spiritual, you know, aura of it. But as, as of now, it's very difficult to feel that spiritual aura. Not having a go at anybody, have a good wedding, but you lose that kind of aura, right? So all this, as you say, you know, the seven days, five days, you have all these ceremonies, and they have big, big pujas for this Manda Murat. You know, it's putting in a put Ganesh and do five minutes. And a lot of different things have some. Okay, now these people don't have time, but at least the thoughts should be in the, the frame of mind should really understand what the significance is. Then I think we're on the right path. Uh, Sita? Yeah, no, I think, I think you're incredibly right in terms of creating a sacred space because you're about to perform a very sacred uh, ritual. So it's really, really important. And I think some of the wonderful things that we can sort of learn from, and it's not just something that you say on the day, it's something that you should remember as much as you can throughout your daily life is this idea of being, you know, lifelong friends with your, with your husband or wife. Um, always sort of looking at their needs, always sort of thinking about them first, thinking about everyone else around you first over yourself, because that's a real step up. Because as a child, you just think about what you need all the time, you know, me, me, me. Um, but when you actually grow up, this is a stage in life where you grow up and you say, it's not all about me and what I want. It's all about everyone else around me, because I have to now look after everyone else. Everyone has been looking after me up until now, my parents and my, you know, grandparents and everybody. Now it's my job to look after everyone. So it's a really, really big step. So to do this in a very sacred way is actually 
incredibly beautiful because you're saying now I am taking on that burden. Um, so that's essentially what spiritual living is all about. So, you know, first stage of life, we're developing our skills and all of that, which is very good. But now we need to apply everything that we have learned in our first stage of life um, through the householder stage. Um, so it can be an incredibly beautiful thing because you are doing it alongside your best friend. Um, so what a, what kind of a beautiful way to celebrate life, really. Um, so, yeah, it's just very important to make sure we keep it as sacred as possible. And I remember um, Dad actually went to a wedding and he was incredibly upset because at the wedding they were serving alcohol and playing Bollywood music at the wedding and he said this is completely we've lost the plot here and we really need to sort of sort ourselves out make sure we trim it down bring it back to the spiritual heart of the whole ceremony that's wonderful to hear Sita Ben Vijay Bhai um, so moving on um, there is this uh, you know Mendi the henna ceremony and the turmeric uh, paste uh, putting all over body. Uh, what is the significance of that, Sita? Uh, so in terms of putting the turmeric paste, I think it's like a cleansing, almost like a beauty regimen <laughs> that you do um, before, before your wedding. But then we always sort of sanctify it and we try and, you know, do these sort of, try and bless everything. And everyone in the family gets involved in applying the turmeric. And, you know, it's a bit of fun and games as well, which is, which is really nice. But I think I, I'm not, I don't know too much about the significance behind it, aside from it being a cleansing process, a way of, you know, connecting the family, bringing everyone together. But actually, the beautiful thing is it's not compulsory to do all of these other ceremonies. Like if you choose not to have it, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're a bad Hindu or whatever. So you can choose to have it. You can choose not to have it. And that's totally fine. You may choose to just have a five minute wedding ceremony. You may, you know, not want to do all of these external sort of rituals. And that's totally up to you. But if you want to do it, you're you're welcome to do it as long as you don't forget the meaning behind it. Uh, Vijay Bhai? Oh, you're a Yeah, I agree with Sita. I think, I think most of these are do with culture more than anything else. But of course, there are some, some cultures which say that it's a sacred uh, ceremony when you put the paste. Some, paste, some say it's to ward of evils. And some say it's actually also to prepare the bride and bride feels that actually she's ready. Or she, she, it was kind of beauty thing, which is not a bad thing. In a way, it's good. So she feels more beautiful, which is important as well. You don't want to go dressed like a drag, you know, and with scruffy hair or whatever. So you have to prepare it nice, of course, as well. Because it's, it's a very important ceremony. So in that sense, all this pre-idea of Mandy, those are all very good. And they're also part of culture. You don't lose that. So that's all okay. And I think we should do all that as well, no doubt, yeah? But eventually focus on the main aim, which is the spiritual aspect of it. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think the with coming of Bollywood in last 20 years, what's happened is there used to be very cultural, you know, like in Gujarati weddings, they used to have yeah. these lovely Gujarati songs being sung uh, during this Mandi and all these festivities going on. And they were kind of very cultural thing and uh, you relate to it. <clears throat> Everyone knew the language and, but now with Bollywood moving in, it's all become dancing to Bollywood songs. How, how do you view this, um, uh, Vijay Bhai? Uh, it's, you know, it's in, in a way, it's very sad because I know some of these old songs mm -hmm. and they're absolutely stunning. There's, a, there's one which I remember very good, yeah, which is, go, you know, regarding, you know, the Krishna stories, yes? There's so many, you know, like this one I know which goes like, you know, Madhava Purno Mandavo Jadava Purni Jan. It's so beautifully sung. When you hear it, it, it really matches, you know, it feels like, wow, you know, or Kundana Pura Viva Rachu. There's so many beautiful songs like that. Some of them, I, I should know them my heart at one time. I should love the, the tune behind it. But, but nowadays, you're right. The songs are like, I don't know <laughs> what they are. I don't even understand the words. So I can't even mention the songs. But, but the traditional songs, if they're sung in a nice way, really suit the wedding and actually kind of merge with the ceremony itself. And they're so beautiful. And to be honest, we have hundreds of them. It's not just one. We have so many of these beautiful songs, right? Which I actually specifically made for this Viva Samskar. But you're right, most people don't want to learn them or don't want to sing them. And they want this very hype music, you know, 
you almost feel like getting a chair and dancing just not what she be doing when in bollywood music he was sitting down and looking at the beauty of the ceremony and this 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 as you mentioned some of these um uh songs the wedding songs the ancient traditional songs they actually bring that message out and you feel so nice and so smoothing yeah when you hear this kind of songs and, and the, 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 the raga actually also is designed for that kind of ceremony so it is absolutely stunning and beautiful or even music so i mean you can play some very nice music and it makes it nice and you know gentle and actually makes you focus on the wedding as well if a bollywood kind of number comes in the middle you lose the focus on what is happening in the mandap you start running over to your you know i don't know what movies you've been watching your mind wanders away so i think we need to change that it's okay to do it afterwards you know go whenever you know but a party later i don't that's okay i think we need to be careful if we keep the ceremony as it should be asita <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, Dad was never a massive Bollywood fan, um, in the sense that you know they just—it's very sort of superficial in the sense that it doesn't focus on any sort of higher message. A lot of these Bollywood songs, um, and um, I think you know Bollywood films are done in such a clever way. You know, they're so incredibly sophisticated and bright and colourful, and you know everyone gets sort of swept up in it to the point where. you know when people choose to get married they kind of want to replicate that feeling like they are the you know bollywood superheroes in the film <laughs> getting married um so i mean you can understand you know that people want to sort of copy that in a way but we if you want to i guess you know that that's your prerogative but don't lose sight of the the message behind it uh, this idea of now i'm taking a step to to live for others um and that that's really something important there's something else i also wanted to sort of go over is you know in a lot of the traditional wedding ceremonies um women are not given equal stature in a lot of the sort of practices and all of that and especially so um in the kanyadan which is the giving of the bride's hand to the groom and you think is you know think oh, there's nothing wrong with that that's totally fine but it's just not fair that it's not even something that's just in the indian culture it's in it's in western culture as well the idea that the father gives the bride away the you know she has to have her hand given away why why can't the groom have his hand given away why is that never a thing um and um in my wedding i was very lucky because dad completely cut, cut that part of the ceremony out he said i'm not giving my daughter's hand away um why should it be that way round uh, why can't the groom also give his hand in marriage or just just leave it just say that it's an equal union between you know a husband and wife and an equal union of two families and it's not one is superior and one is inferior because this idea of women not being considered equal is something that has sort of you know it's like a virus which has gone around the world it's something that we need to sort of pull out of the system and hinduism is so wonderfully flexible we have the freedom to say i can cut out parts which are no longer relevant and this idea of kanyadan is no longer relevant um and we should definitely try and pull it out and i hope in days to come that people will say hang on this part is no longer relevant anymore it's an equal union i'm not having to give my daughter away like she's cattle i'm going to say that this is an equal union between two families and it's actually pretty bad because sometimes when you go around the fire they sing this song saying first i give away cows but then i give away gold and then at the end you say i give away my daughter and it's just shocking that what you're equating your daughter to cows and gold really <laughs> uh, it's it's really not fair <laughs> so i hope as days to cut it come that when people start to realize the meaning and the significance behind these rituals that they'll say hang on this is really not fair we should take this out I hope the day will come when people will start to look at these rituals. And actually I said to some of the Eton boys I was like when you get married make sure you check with your priest what you're doing in your ceremony and pull it out <laughs> pull out the bits which are not relevant. Um and I think there's a real need for that because the system hasn't really updated with um with modern times really. Uh Vijay bhai Yeah I think one thing we have to be careful about is in these weddings is that Now all these processes are so mechanical, and the way people just do them, you know, first do this and has to marry up, then do this and do that, then can you done? It's just like automatic, like you know, going on a uh, what do you call a roller belt, and <laughs> nobody understands what they do. But I actually agree that I think something has to be done on uh, changing the way we do the weddings. 
times have changed and I think very ceremony should change as well. So we have to keep that in mind. We can't just stick to something. The times and contemporary times of the olden times was really different from now and we need to move on. Yeah. Uh, so Sita Ben touched on the very important part, Kanyadan, uh, which uh, we've had some videos come out, which some people trying to justify Kanyadan and saying it's not giving away of the daughter and it's not a dan and in the traditional sense, and it's just saying it's a gotra dan, the kanya changing, the bride changing the gotra. Would you agree with that sort of... Uh, view uh vijay bhai uh, or uh, are we w no. what is your take on this uh, no actually i have read this, uh, some of the scriptures it is it is done by giving her a daughter it's not all this play of words i know people feel uncomfortable nowadays because they think oh it, i know it sounds bad more so we should try and play with words it's a fact women were given away as a done in the olden days especially you can see there's so many different kinds of weddings where it was given as a gift in exchange of gifts, literally. So I think we should accept how things really are. If you don't accept it, then we won't change them. And to be honest, they were being given away as a dan, literally as a gift. And that is something that has to change. No matter how much play with words, how many videos you do, that, it doesn't change the fact that this was how it was happening before. And we need to now make it more equal. So that's all I can add to that, uh, Sita. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. There's a real sort of need to, to look at the meaning behind each aspect of the ritual and cut out the bits which are no longer relevant. And um, I mean, it's not even in, in the Indian sort of subcontinent. It's even it's throughout the world. Why does the, the girl have to change her surname? Why does the girl have to go and live in the boy's house? Why does every, women have to do everything, all the sacrificing? It just doesn't seem fair. And uh, the system needs to change for sure. Wonderful. Uh, I think somebody just mentioned this uh, Kanyadan meaning Gotradan. Um, you have anything to add? Is it a Gotradan? What, what is Gotradan, uh, Vijay? <laughs> So I think the idea of the, the Gotra is, I mean, you know, the thing is that, of course, the Gotras cannot be the same, right? So in a way, is, from what I understand, is giving the daughter uh, as a, because she's going to change, the, in a way, Gotra will be different now she gets married. But nevertheless, it's seen as like that sometimes, Dan, but it's seen as a Dan in that sense, right? So I think that it, people call it that sometimes, I agree with you, that they don't say Kanya Dan, they go through them, but you don't hear the wedding, you only hear Kanyadan, Kanyadan. But it's it's a similar concept because I think mainly we get the paternal name. And that was, that's now changing because I know some Hindu boys were saying, No, I'm going to take my mother's son, in, which creates a huge hoo ha, you know, in, in the community. Oh, you're going to change a thousand year tradition. But things are changing. So I think the main thing to keep in mind is to realize that the, is, a, is a marriage of equal partners. And we should try and keep that in mind. Yeah. That, that's the main thing here, uh, Sita. Uh, yeah, and no, I think you've covered it amazingly. There's not much more I can add to it. Okay. Uh, one thing negative, uh, again, that is now going away is uh, dowry, uh, dowry or the gifts given by the bride's family outweighing what, uh, bra you know, what how much money a bridegroom uh, uh, family will uh, spend. And... Uh, it had become uh, the, the girls were seen as liability because of that, because they had to give away so much money to get that uh, uh, girl married to a good family. And although it's on the way out, it still causes problem at now and then. What is your take on this, Sita? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, again, the dowry system is is completely outdated, and it's a shame that it does maybe happen um, in you know sort of Indian villages and stuff it probably still does go on and it's really terrible because it creates this situation where if somebody gives birth to a girl they see it as something very negative very bad because it means that later on they're going to have to pay out loads of money they're going to have, have to give away their wealth in order to get their daughter married and they see her as a liability for her whole life even as a little girl they see her as a liability and it's terrible because then people are more likely to want to have abortions if they know that it's going to be a girl. And it creates such tremendous pain. It creates 
a real sort of you know discord in the community and the population uh, there's a unequal balance between male and female children being born um, so there's all sorts of incredibly negative things which happen as a result of the dowry system but if this is all sort of like wiped away and we say it's an equal union nobody needs to give anything to anybody it's it's no kind of obligation on any family's part then all for the best really then there's no need for all of this awful atrocities committed in the name of seeing your child your girl as a liability so I really hope and pray that things will continue to change um, in the days and years to come uh, Vijay Pai? Yeah I think that is a very very bad practice I mean dowry because I know that in our at least in my tradition the Swamian tradition in the code of conduct book that we have is strictly for me seen as a big sin. To ask for dowry and give sorry is seen as a huge sin. So I think by and large, most modern reformers, from what I understand, have explicitly, ex explicitly banned the idea of dowry. This creates all kinds of problems. And I think every society where women actually do well, society all on the whole does well. So if you put this kind of, bring this kind of, uh, what do you call, unfair practices, it, it, it's got repercussions not just for that particular wedding, for the entire society, and we should keep that in mind. So we should not really have this practice. And if somebody's doing that, is from what I know, talking a lot of acharyas in modern India, it's a big sin. So you're committing a huge sin. Yeah, that's like that, that Manish Bhai. Yeah. Thank you, Vijay Bhai, uh, Sita Ben. So uh, as we see, there is uh, that cultural element, and then there is a um, spiritual element to a Hindu wedding. So these two be separated. So, you know, people want to invite all the friends and the extended family to the wedding and have everything together. So they make the actual wedding ceremony smaller and just those who would actually be interested in the wedding be there at the actual wedding ceremony. And then a separate party element where people enjoy and meet and have all these cultural things going on. Is that a way to go, uh, Vijay Bhai? Okay, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that quite often culture is very close to religion as well, but the, the cultural aspects of the wedding should actually be geared to making the wedding, you know, proper wedding, you know, proper cultural wedding. So culture is there and the wedding is also spiritual, but it has to help the spiritual wedding. But if you go after the party and that is, that is okay, but that's something not linked to the wedding, then I don't really <laughs> consider concerned about it. But in the wedding, the cultural aspects we'll always have because, you know, you do certain activities, but they should be helping you to enhance the spiritual experience. That's the key thing to keep in mind. And it's always been the case that we have a lot of culture, you know, activities we do, but to enhance the wedding, that's the key thing. But when you go totally other way, Sita was mentioning, you know, alcohol, booze, party, you know, full sideways, getting drunk, all that stuff is nothing to do with this and should be kept separately. I, I wouldn't, promote that but if you want to do that that's that's your business <laughs> Nasita. Uh, yeah I mean it, it's one of those things because we are never prescriptive in the sense that you must do this so it's just one of those things that it needs to come from your heart to say actually I would like to do a ceremony which is meaningful a ceremony which is short and simple and sweet and you know if I want to have a party later on with my friends and family then that's fine as well um, so it's, it's beautiful to have the cultural mixed with the spiritual and I think it just needs to come from people's hearts to say actually I want to change I want to do something different rather than this very sort of commercialized and superficial way of getting married um, and make sure that we remember um, what it's all about really not just a big party there's there is a lot more to it Wonderful. Thank you, Sita Bin. Um, so one last question. Uh, nowadays, with, uh, you know, especially in the Western countries, uh, stag parties and hand parties becoming part of a wedding as well. What What is your take uh, view on this, uh, Sita Bin? Uh, I mean, to be honest, I didn't want a hen party. And then my cousins were like, you have to have a hen party. So I had to <laughs> Any party. And the um, thing is, like, it's one of those things where, you know, you can choose to go completely wild and crazy, but, you know, uh, it's one of those things, maybe it's a legitimate desire. If you want to do it, do it. I mean, I didn't really want to do it. 
Um, so everyone is different um, and it's nothing to do with any sort of spiritual message or anything it's just it is like a party really um, you know before you get married and that that's totally fine as long as you know you don't get too drunk and you don't realize what's going on and you feel sick and hungover the next morning because that's not fun either so you just as long as it's all done in moderation then I guess there's nothing wrong with it um Vijay Pai? Yeah, I think you have to be careful about these parties because there was once I think one party where the actually the 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 groom I think they call it bachelor's party and the groom actually passed out by drinking when they asked him next day he didn't go I really enjoyed it but but he passed out how could they have enjoyed it <laughs> but you know so you wonder sometimes yeah I think if you get together with friends and celebrate and have something reasonable then I think it's it's a good thing to do because you, you want friends to be involved in your you know in this wonderful occasion but just Make sure this is is in a measured sense, right? Not something too wild that you you totally lose focus and you know you lose your your your, your you know your brain power. Then don't do that. I would say that that's all I can add to that, uh, Manish. Bhai. Yeah. Now, so I think we've covered this wedding to topic quite in detail. There, uh, we'll close this chapter now, and I'll invite uh, Nisit Bai to for some uh, rapid fire Q and A, please. Well, um, we have a couple of questions from the viewers. Um, we have one from uh, uh, Dirad Singh Bhau, and he's basically saying that somebody called him to become an Aryan and that I don't hail from India. Uh, he says, I just look like anybody else where I am from. Hasn't the Aryan myth been debunked? Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that? I, I didn't realize this is still a thing right now. <laughs> Okay, I mean, there there is nothing called Aryan race, right? That's that's been proven by everybody, even the Max Muller, who was seen as proponent of Aryan theory. Aryan just means somebody who's of noble intent. In the ancient India, there was quite a property, like they would say, Mister or Sir today. It's quite often to say, like you know, I would say Arya Manish, Arya Nishit was quite a common term to use. It's just a, a, a term of nobility, you know, and respect. That's it. There is no tribe. There is no record race called Aryan race. That is something that's been brought up, I think, uh, linked to the you know the Nazis. So the fact they've been called to be, the, be called, uh, they're called to become an Aryan, that in itself is a problem because what do you mean by that? Yes. So anybody who's of noble character can be called an Aryan. It's just a simple a grammatical term, and that's it. And we should leave it there. The Aryan invasion theory that's already been debunked. Even the very strong support of Aryan invasion, even they who still don't come, they've called it Aryan migration theory now. Like the Romila Thapar, who was a very strong proponent of our invasion theory, there's no evidence in the ground. There's no evidence. So even though they don't like the idea is, is you know, India theory, out of India theory, they still, uh, they even they have to accept there's no, there's no invasion. They now call it migration theory. So it is, it is out of the window. The still of remnants still have stuck to it, but there's no our invasion theory. I think don't go to that club or whoever's calling you to become Marian. It's not necessary. Don't do that. That's all I can say to that, Sita. <laughs> yeah, I think you've covered it amazingly. I mean, I think it's one of those things you have to make sure that different races and stuff, they don't become something you use to segregate communities. You should try and use it to integrate communities. So anything which supports that is always positive. Brilliant. So we have another viewer called uh, Ayush, um, Ayush Kumar, and his question is quite simple. It is, why are Hindus not united? Now, I asked him for a little bit more context behind it, because that could mean anything. But I am suggesting that it means in terms of not united in bringing Hinduism forward. See that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think it's one of those things that, especially in terms of bringing Hinduism forward, um, you know, we, you know, through our history, our recent history as India, we've kind of gone through a phase of being incredibly secular in our approach, in our lifestyle. We are, you know, we've copied the Western approach to life and lifestyle um, incredibly uh, over the last sort of 50, 100 years. And we've lost sight um, of our sort of spiritual inheritance, which has been, you know, the thing which has kept us strong. It's kept us going through numerous invasions over thousands of years. 
and to sort of just lose it at the drop of a hat like this, it just doesn't seem right. So anything that we can do to sort of promote the beautiful spiritual messages at the heart of Hinduism, and you don't even need the tops and tails, you don't need all these long-winded rituals, you don't need all of that, as long as you live your life true to that spiritual message, then that's really sort of promoting Hinduism in the most sort of gentle way without going out there proselytizing and saying you must be Hindu, you must do this and that and that. It's not like that. Hinduism is not that kind of a religion. Mm. As long as you go out there and you see the world, you see everybody around you as a manifestation of spirit and you see that, you know, the same thing that's inside you is inside everybody else that can really influence your life and transform other lives for the better. Um, and that's the best way that we can promote Hinduism and how to bring it into the modern world. So there's a lot that we can do um, on that front. And I hope that people don't keep seeing Hinduism as something old fashioned and something that, you know, we should feel ashamed of, something we should hide about something that we should be proud about and say, you know, it it's really helps us to live incredibly ethically moral lives because everyone is divine, essentially. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you that there's, there's a lot of reasons why Hindus are not united. I think partly as we've been having this so-called circular word, which in many ways has taken away from understanding our own roots. And that's been a big problem because some of the key powerful messages of Hinduism, like you know, the idea of spiritual democracy, idea of you know, pluralism, this is powerful words. If you understand Hinduism really well, then I think you'd be in a stronger position to understand other Hindus and work together. But the thing is that because even, even the, I would say even the media as such in India for so long has been so focused on taking you away from the ideas of Hinduism, idea of you know, diversity, pluralism, that's all been taken away. This may so secular. And I know some Hindus I've talked to, they go, oh, Hinduism is just weird with loads of different strange beliefs, you know, all this stuff. What kind of things that I think we should just be modern and secular? When you ask them what that means, they have no idea. So Hinduism has got some really beautiful things. And I think the key thing is to understand your own faith first. That's why as this is by keeps on promoting our course, please attend the course, understand it. Automatically, you get with other Hindus. It just comes naturally to you. If you understand what Hinduism is about, then you really move forward. And I would say, in many ways, I'm feeling more positive now. I've seen in India, a lot of young youth are coming out who understand the beautiful message of Hinduism, understand the idea of, you know, indigeneity when everybody's out of belief in God as they want, yet at the same time, see everybody's divine. So all these very, very profound ideas of Hinduism are coming into the fore again. So I'm quite optimistic that in the future, Hindus will get united and they don't have to preach anything, just the way they live and the way they understand the world. People are just because of ideas and adopt it for themselves. Yeah. Fantastic. So folks, we are already almost 50 minutes into this session. I still have a couple of questions. So one is from Sanjay Jha and he's asking, can, how can chanting of mantras help in increasing <laughs> one's intelligence? Is there any divine energy flow in mental state, um, is it something that really happens, or is it just something that we've been told uh, that will happen? So, is there, uh, chanting the mantras does it help you in increasing your mental abilities? Uh, can I add this? It's not me saying it, but a lot of professors who have actually researched it, and it's, this is true because there's a big study done by Harvard. I read an article uh, just recently, in, I think Scientific American, where they're saying that. They actually uh, uh, monitor the Tibetan Buddhist monks who chant, and they chant long, long mantras, really complex mantras, and repeat them continuously. The fact that they could remember to say the same word again and again, and in the same meter, in the same timing, same everything, over and over again for a long time, and they could see their brain activity heightened. So there's a lot of evidence that this kind of activity, if you do it in the proper manner, and you understand the mantras, and you really focus on repeating them in a, same sequence. It's like singing. You know, people learn how to train singing. If you ever listen to like Pandit Yashraj, you know, like when he sings Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva, the first time he says it, and after 10 minutes, it's the same length, same tone, same pitch, same rising of pitch. They can maintain it consistently. To do that, you could have a proper brain to do that. So there's a lot of benefits of chanting. But if it's a bore for you and you don't chant properly and you lose the focus, then of course not. But if you do it properly, there's evidence is actually, there's a lot of evidence scientifically proven that actually helps you. 
And of course, you get divine energy if you if you work properly. Your mind is very well developed. Hopefully, you'll have a divine energy coming to you as well. So it has been proven from experience done so far that chanting in a proper manner does help you increase your intelligence. I haven't done it, but this is what I'm seeing from what I've read, <laughs> Sita. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I mean, there, I think there really is is a benefit to it. And I think it really sort of rings true that any kind of disciplined human endeavor, which is what dad was always saying, um, any disciplined human endeavor can lead you to the divine, can lead you to the spiritual. And this is a disciplined endeavor because you're having to sit, close your eyes, um, chant over and over again, something which a lot of people would think, oh, that's a bit boring. But you just keep doing it because, you know, you really want to touch base with that true spiritual nature, which is already inside you. And this is the tool that you use to touch base with it. And it could be anything like chanting mantras. It can be worshipping an image of, of your deity that you love. It can be anything. It can be worshipping the living God out there. Um, so anything that you do with true heart and discipline can lead you to the divine. Brilliant. We have one other question from a viewer called Sagar Pawar. The question is, I wonder why Vedic Hinduism and post-Vedic Hinduism are so different. Uh, Sita, you have, I can have a question. Okay, it is true, it's very different. The Vedic idea, the Vedic periods, I mean, at that time, there's a lot of the way things were done, the idea of fire worship was very popular because, as you know, even the very first of the Rig Veda, Agni, Mite, Puro, Hita, you know, I bow to Agni, stars like that. So the idea of worshiping forces, doing sacrifice, heavens was very popular in those days. And in the Vedic period, also, you'd be surprised, gods like Vishnu, uh, they were not popular at that time as, as much as the Vedic gods. But then the ideas of Upanishads, of course, come out which very profound. But then even the ideas of Upanishads are very, very abstract, very philosophical. But post-Vedic period, when I think India developed further, I would say that during the Gupta period, which is after just B, just after BC, when AD was coming, 1-5 AD, that time the, the, what do you call, the cultural aspect really flowered and music, art, dance came up. And from then on, the gods which are like seen as attractive, you know, gold with form and shape became more and more popular. But that that is something that, you know, in the since the, in the progress of humanity, we have ups and downs. We believe in that first. And now again, Advaita Vedanta is coming up very quickly again. People are becoming more and more Advaita in nature. So it's just as society is changing, uh, we are, uh, the people's beliefs will change. But that's the beauty of Hinduism, right? Hinduism allows you to do that. It allows you to adapt, change as your understanding of the world increases. As the con context you watch it, context in which you live, the context in which you worship God changes. So it's not only that it's from Vedic to post-Vedic, even within the post-Vedic, there have been a lot of changes taking place from Shankara, you know, from Vedanta, of Advaita Vedanta, from Shankara, Ramanuja, then Madhava, Chaitanya. So it's been changing all the time. It's not new. And it's, as, as even now, it's changing. So that's how, that's why Hinduism survived for that long, because you're not stuck in a rut. We keep on understanding, believing in God the way we suits us best based on the geography, tradition, environment, and so forth. Asita? Uh, yeah, it, it's true. I mean, that's actually the beauty of Hinduism is that it is free to change because if we were stuck with the free sort of, you know, ancient, ancient th thinking about Hinduism, it would just be like something that you look at in, in a museum. It's not something that's <laughs> relevant and current anymore. So this idea of, you know, worshipping wind and you know fire and all of that it, it appeals to humanity at that particular time in history but humanity continues to evolve and change and it's changed dramatically over the last thousands thousands of years and you know it's Hinduism has gone through all sorts of phases um worshipping nature um, you know, worshipping God with form, um, you know, this idea of moving away from rituals, coming very much into rituals. And there's all sorts of different phases because that's the sort of evolving nature of the human mind. Um, and as Vijay Bhai said, currently, this idea of Advaita Vedanta is becoming incredibly popular because it does weigh with the idea of God as a personality, you know, because God as a personality comes with so much baggage, so many unanswered philosoph philosophical questions around suffering and why is the world the way it is if God is all compassionate. So this idea of Advaita Vedanta puts everything on, on our shoulders and say, well, you are spirit, you are God, you do something about it. So it's incredibly empowering and um, Hinduism will continue to change and that's that's the beauty of it. 
Fabulous. So I have one interesting question. We started off this uh, session today with the topic of the Hindu marriage ceremony. The, the question to wrap it up brings it back to that same topic. So we have a question from Harshita Singh asking, what are your thoughts on the caste system in the Hindu marriage ceremony? So many people are against their children marrying, I mean, sorry, getting into a marriage with somebody from another caste. Now, I have seen this over the years. It is getting better. People are becoming more open-minded. But um, this was indeed a problem before. Now, what started off as a, 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 as a decent uh, way of stratifying society by the level of work they're doing was then twisted out of context, I think, in, in some sort of a really bad way. Uh, thankfully, as people grow and evolve in the modern times, I think this is going away. But it will take some time for it to uh, for people to fully open up and agree that it doesn't really matter what caste they're from, as long as the two people are compatible and they will carry on, you know, uh, as a couple. But what are your thoughts, uh, team? Finally, I'll start with Manish by this time, but this is the final question. I think in the earlier days, because people were doing specific jobs, uh, so it made sense if you marry in the same people who are doing similar jobs. So the, the whole family got involved in that profession. Uh, so it kind of helped uh, that if somebody came from the same background and then knew what, what they had to do as part of the family. But this is no longer the case. Um, everyone's doing everything else. And there's another thing is uh, cultural choices and uh, what people eat. Now, some families are vegetarian and some are non-veggies. So there are these issues where if uh, someone eating veg, may uh, marrying someone non-veg, there are problems and there they have fights before because of that as well. So it's the, the, the idea was to have someone with a similar background so that you have less problems. But nowadays, uh, it's like that background is very similar. So it's no longer relevant. That's, that's my point of view. Fantastic. I think that's, that's a really, really good uh, you know, point of view as well. Sita Ben? Uh, yeah, I completely agree. So, I mean, you can understand some of the logic behind, you know, you've had a similar upbringing, you eat the same kind of food at home. Um, you can understand, you know, that kind of thinking. But the way that the caste system has been, you know, for you know for the last few hundred years, it was a stratification. So, you know, if somebody is of a supposedly higher caste and getting married to somebody of a supposedly lower class, it was a big cause for a problem. It was a big scandal. And it's really, really unfortunate that that's the way, you know, humanity sort of, you know, it's a human failing. Um, but because we no longer see, especially in the UK anyway, we no longer see all of these castes as higher and lower, but there, it's just a benevolent sort of clan system. You're, you just belong to this clan and I belong to this clan. There's no hierarchy between them. So, you know, in the UK, there's no need for us to be like, oh, he's from a higher or lower caste. As long as they get on well with each other, that's that's all that really matters. Uh, Vijay Pai? I think Manish by the key points he mentions are very true. The profession is to drive at one time. But now I think more than profession is also, as Sita mentioned, clans. Like in my community, the Patel community we have, people would marry a similar person because of, you know, because they have cultural, same cultural upbringing, same historical background. So it's easier to get along. But I mean, it's all changing now because my children are not even that linked to my cultural tradition. They're living in a very different modern world. So for them, somebody with similar education, similar is what they're going to kind of marry. Even in India, you'd be surprised. I mean, when I went to see recently in India, uh, before COVID, three years ago, and some of my cousin's children, they are marrying somebody they found in university, right? Which is like a, like a Gujarati marrying a Marathi. And I would say, but why have problem? We had no problem because the society is now changing. I think people forget even in UK 200 years ago, it's not that far behind. It looks really far, but nobility will only marry nobility. You had the Smiths, only marrying the Smiths. It was not something that only unique to India. It just made out to be like it's an Indian thing, but it's not. It should be practiced worldwide, right? You marry in the same clan community. So it, was, it wasn't the case only in, in India, but even now India is changing with education and with different people you make mix in societies, you know, mobile society, people living in urban areas. All these are complex issues and 
things are changing so hopefully for the better uh, nishit bhai <laughs> super what a rounded discussion we had now i did say that would be the last question but i've got somebody who is question i missed out on earlier and i did promise i will ask this question so one more question to go this is from altaf khan and his question is what happened to the body of the elephant whose head became part of ganesh ji and what happened to the head of the human figure whose body was ganesh ji yeah Okay, I can have a go. Okay, the, in the stories you hear that the, the Ganesh, the, the elephant, was actually sent to heaven. So he immediately became a spiritual being and was freed, given moksha. Apparently, that's what uh, I, I asked similar questions. So it's not only him; even Hindus still don't ask this question. So this is given moksha. At the regard the head, I'm not sure of the head, which was basically Ganesh. <laughs> But again, there must be some sort of ceremony to get whatever. But I think the key thing to remember is that in Hinduism, all life is, is divine. So the fact that Elephant is seen as a divine being with Atman, so we don't distinguish as such in that sense. Like you know, you have a story where, like in many Abrahamic stories, you have God is asking someone to sacrifice his son. Those animals seen as different, but here, in that sense, you can see that elephant's head was perfectly okay, seen as important. Didn't distinguish that you must have a human head. Elephant was perfectly fine for Ganesh. Because the whole Hindu idea is that all life is sacred, all life is divine. We are not that different. We are not special in that sense. In, in in terms of the atman okay we are special in terms of how we can you know better chance of getting moksha but in terms of divinity we are all similar in the same level so yes valid question in that sense anything to add uh, manish bhai sita <laughs> i would i would say they must have cremated the body and the head because it's no longer useful yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I just one more thing to add. I mean, I think that that's so beautiful that you know we don't distinguish and you know between yeah. animal, everyone is to everything is divine. Um, just one thing to add is that remember that this is actually yeah. a story. It's yes, not literally yeah. true. So please don't think that this actually happened. It's a mythological story. Yeah. Understand it for what it is. And my daughter actually asked the same question when I was telling her this story. I said it's a colorful story. Enjoy it for what it is, and just try and get the message. behind it that's the most important thing yeah. fabulous speaking of getting the message behind things uh, let me share with you guys a quick uh, number of resources we do have a hinduism basics of hinduism online course uh, which as you can see is starting to grow again we are at almost 23 80 uh, 300 students um, so feel free to join this course it will give you a good uh, basic information about the hindu culture and religion and uh, we also have our main website this is where you can go hindu-academy.com you can enroll in that e learning course, course hello here. everybody this is nishit kotak from there is also our e books which you can download from here as well but finally i'd i'd like to share with you a resource we don't talk about so often this is our soundcloud channel and if you're somebody who is out on the road or you got podcasts and you listen to audio uh, rather than video because this is a, a wonderful resource we've basically taken the live streams converted them into audio we have nearly 500 tracks now uploaded and you can listen into the session instead of looking at a video and that way you can get your uh, quick fix on hinduism as well and finally before we close the session i'd like to share something relevant to today's topic which i saw uh, with a picture of swami vivekananda relations are more important than life but it is important for those relationships to have life in them and uh, so that came off a very interesting conversation i had just online with one of our regular viewers christine uh, and so relevant for today's topic and i hope with that we can bring today's session to a close thank you so much everybody for participating and asking your questions it's interesting to see everybody's takes on marriage as a institution and hindu marriage ceremony in particular and thank you for sharing all your thoughts and feedback and uh, we will look forward to seeing you next week on saturday 2 o'clock as usual thank you to the team here who have done a fantastic job in answering all those questions and we look forward to seeing you next week bye bye for now